I would love to be a fly on the wall for your weekend because it's no secret that private equity interest has been in and around the regional banks. Were you interested at all in buying First Republic assets? So assets, yeah, we're always interested in buying assets but not in the banking business. We, like others, we're not banks, we don't intend to be banks, we don't buy banks, but if we can be supportive of restructuring of the banking system through the purchase of assets, absolutely. Now, I want you to look beyond even just today, because we have the first Republic sale to JP Morgan, but you have Jamie Dimon saying that the banking crisis is almost over. Do you see a whole second wave of this crisis coming? I think part one of the banking crisis is over. And I, I would never disagree with Jamie because this is his job and he lives it. But if I, my observation is what's happened so far, totally predictable. Mark to market losses in treasury securities, well known to everyone. Structure of deposits above minimum guarantees, well known to everyone. Are we surprised? We shouldn't be. Everyone knew what was happening here. Raising, rising rates created the stress. The interesting thing to me is not whether these three banks failed. It's what's the business of regional banking going forward? Think about it, 42 billion left SVB in four hours without a line. So you're now the CEO of a big regional bank. Your cost of funds is up, your regulatory costs are up. Can you lend money? Or is your business model gonna need to change, gonna need to evolve? I think that's what's interesting and I think we have a second wave in commercial real estate. The second wave in commercial real estate, do you think that that wave pertains to the banking system at large or a broader set of investors? I think it is, look, there are lots of people who own real estate across the world, and across the economy. Investors who own real estate suffer losses. Investors suffer losses all the time. Growth stocks go down, investors suffer losses. That to me is not systemic in any way. A banking system which has government guarantees where people put their money in, in a trust relationship, if they suffer significant losses, that's what causes concern. And that's what we have here. It won't be systemic in my view, but it'll be concentrated. Regional banks, once again, are the primary lenders to many of our regional real estate issues. Now, we just saw this morning the big get bigger, JP Morgan buying a massive regional bank, but what happens to the banking system moving forward? You mentioned there will be changes. What does the new banking system look like coming out of these troubles? I think it's already changed. We have, uh, we have yet to adjust to the changes of 2008. So if you think about 2008 and Dodd-Frank, ostensibly the legislation was to restrict the exposure of the U.S. economy to large, systemically important banks. By the way, it worked. Banks are less than 20% of all lending in the U.S. The new banks, by the way, are investors. Everyone who's at this conference today, in some way or another, participates in the banking system. But if you ask about banking proper, I do think in the short term we're gonna see the big get bigger. People fly to safety when you have any sort of crisis. J.P. Morgan is positioned to step in to fix, save, First Republic. Should not be surprised. But now, regional banks are a very attractive political entity. Everyone has a regional bank. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see how the system deals with the fundamental issues facing regional banking. Yeah, well, you mentioned banking system has already been our only 20% of the country's lending here. So what does that mean for who will and will not be able to have access to credit in the future? Look, we are, I'll, I'll say it at a country level, we are 50% of the world's capital. We are, our businesses benefit, our government benefit, our consumers benefit. We already have unrestricted assets to credit. Sometimes it's more expensive, sometimes it's less expensive. Go anywhere else in the world, we are the envy of the world. No one has what we have. So I don't know that it gets to who has access to credit. The democratization of credit through the investor investment marketplace has already created unparalleled access. Now, if you think about the commercial real estate issues that we've been talking about, I'm really wondering, I know over at Apollo, you guys look at things security by security, sometimes building by building. <laughs> what are the office vacancies telling you about the state of the commercial real estate market? It's a bad day to be an office owner in San Francisco and Chicago. I mean, we could get more granular yeah. than that. But I step back and again try to put it in big picture. Every piece of real estate everywhere in the world that was purchased pre the run-up in interest rates as a result of the change in interest rates is now worth less. We've had such a move in interest rates and real estate is an interest rate sensitive activity that everything is worth less. It does not mean it won't come back. It does not mean it won't ultimately be, be a good investment. But in the short term, we have significant dislocation. But we also have this change in how people use real estate, office being the most visible, we are going to see losses. 
Now I'm sitting here in conversation with Mark Rowan, the CEO of Apollo Global Management. Now Mark, you know, you mentioned this kind of pain that the office system is still yet to see, the office buildings and the commercial real estate. Now, what does that mean not just for investors in commercial real estate, but also investors in the regional banks as a derivative effect? Do you think the market is still undercounting how bad things can get? I think the market has yet to ask the long-term question. Right now, the question being asked is, is the bank safe? Will there be a run on the bank? Will it survive? Safety, I believe, has been our primary focus, but we've already seen the government can make this safe with the stroke of a pen. I believe the banking system to be safe. That is different than what is the business of a regional bank going forward? If you don't know how sticky your deposits are, if your cost of funds is high, if your cost of operations is high, what is your business model going forward? Like every other industry that has had to adjust to technology, regional banking is going to have to adjust to technology. I'll be shocked if five years from now, the business model of a regional bank looks like what they do today. Now let's take a big step back for a second because there's this big understanding in the industry that you're in that you can't unwind 12 years of easy money so easily. And you saw a lot of hiccups already, the LDI crisis in the UK, uh, now the regional banking crisis, the crypto crash. What else is still yet to break? Look, it's, it's hard to be a predictor of what else is, is to break, but I look at places in the world where we have mismatches between liquid asset, uh, liquid liabilities like a bank, borrow short and lend long. We have other places in the world where that same buildup has taken place. 10 years, 12 years of easy money forced people to do unnatural things to look for yield and to look for rate of return. LDI was the first time Systemically, the question was called. LDI was nothing more than a misplaced expectation on the part of UK institutions that public securities were liquid. They found out they're only liquid on the way up, they're not liquid on the way down. We have that same in certain open-ended mutual funds. We've seen it in ETFs in point of stress. We've seen it even in some private vehicles in point of stress. So this is not a public or private issue. This is a mismatch between the underlying liquidity of assets and the structure of liabilities. Well, speaking of the public markets, there's some question about how well the public markets have actually held up in the face of some of this. You know, how safe can you feel in the fact that you have liquidity? <laughs> Look, I, I step back and I, I think about what's happened in the world and the difference between public and private. We used to think public was safe and private was risky. We now know public can be risky as well. We now have found out that private can be both safe and risky. What we're talking about is differing degrees of liquidity. What we have elected to do in our industry, and certainly for Apollo, is we focus on private. And the reason we focus on private is we don't believe there is sustainable alpha, excess return, in publicly traded markets, particularly in publicly traded debt markets. Therefore, if investors come to us for excess return, we need to step away from daily liquid markets. Fortunately, there's plenty for us to do. Now, just this morning, there was news about a rival of yours, Blackstone, facing another wave of redemptions when it comes to its semi-liquid vehicle, when it comes to the real estate market. You know, a lot of big private credit funds, big private equity funds are trying to court retail investors. When you look at some of the hiccups that some of the current funds are facing in the market here, uh, some of the challenges when it comes to the investors ask for their money back uh, with the, uh, for, for long-dated investments here on the other side, what does it tell you about the direction of travel? Is investor confidence in retail semi-liquid funds becoming dented in this environment? Um, I don't know about dented. Uh, first, I think Blackstone is doing exactly the right thing. Uh, I think the industry owes them a debt of gratitude because they are teaching investors that alternatives are not an ATM. Now, they're in an asset class that is under stress because people are concerned about real estate valuations and they are redeeming because they think valuations are headed down. Blackstone is behaving responsibly and doing exactly what they are supposed to do and what these vehicles are designed to do. But I look forward and I think about the structure of our business. I think retail investors, high net worth, are gonna be 50% allocated to alternatives in the next five years. No. 50. But not alternatives, private equity and hedge funds. Alternatives are just alternatives to publicly traded stocks and bonds. They go from double A to equity. What do you say to people who criticize the private markets, the credit markets in particular, as masking some of the risks that would be in public credit markets? I think the easiest thing to value is a bond. 
Bonds are cash flows, interest rate, and duration, and bonds adjust quickly. The fact is, better risk reward has been available in private markets than in public markets for much of the last 10 to 12 years. Everyone in our industry has picked a different segment. The segment we've picked is private investment grade. Private investment grade is something people haven't even contemplated. Think about what banks used to do, what GE Capital used to do. That's the business we've built. And at 400 billion of private credit, mostly investment grade, unfortunately, we're not relevant. It sounds like a lot, 400 billion, but we're talking about a $40 trillion market. We have a long way to go. 400 billion, but getting bigger as well. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in Washington, for example, about regulating non-banks. Do you think that you will face tighter regulation as things progress? I think we all face tighter regulation. That is clearly the direction of travel. Ultimately, people look for, is the information available? Yes, the information is already public. Are we mismatched in terms of borrowing short and lending long? No, we're actually counter-cyclical. And the vast majority of institutions, counter-cyclical as well. Are we levered? No. Are we concentrated? No. Are we a diversifier for the economy? Yes. At the end of the day, the US financial system is the envy of the world. We are 50% of all the action everywhere in the world. And it's a result of decisions made along the way to allow investors to be suppliers of credit. Well, I think that's the other part of the argument here. If not you, then who? That's the choice. The US economy, the world economy, will need a certain amount of credit. And the choices are, do you allow it to be supplied exclusively by the banking system backed by government guarantees, as we have in many foreign countries? Or do we allow investors, broadly defined, retail investors, high net worth investors, pension investors, institutions, to participate and get diversification and socialization of risk? Investors, for the most part, are prepared for things that go up and down. Things that go up and down. You had mentioned kind of the benefits of the private markets in terms of return opportunities here in the credit markets. I'm curious about what you think about the current state of investment grade when you look at the public markets. There has been a lot of discussion about how eerily calm that spreads have been behaving in the face of what many feel is a pending recession. Do you think that there's more risks under the surface when you look at public credit? I don't think there's more risks under the surface. I think that you have a confused market. You have lots of talk about recession and you have a yield curve the shape of which is up and then down. So it does not surprise me that investors who are being offered yields today of a certain magnitude are active in locking them in. You've Especially after a decade of very low rates. Well, you've mentioned also, I've heard you say a few times, that kind of the era of equity is eroding here. Does that make a bigger kind of secular push to credit in general? I think it does. I think this is an amazing entry point for credit, not just because we're in it, but because of what's transpired. Um, equity, we printed $8 trillion from 2008 until 2022. Exactly what was supposed to happen happened. Now that we've started withdrawing it, Entry point for credit is fabulous, has adjusted very quickly. Liquidity has eroded. Banking crisis has further eroded it. We have a unique entry point for credit. It will not always be this good. Equity has adjusted somewhat, but not nearly as much as credit. Now also, I mean, we've seen from the banking system that what was safe yesterday can be rated as junk tomorrow. Do you not believe that we would be facing a greater wave of downgrades? I think all priced in. There's no doubt. But if you are concerned about the direction of travel, if there's uncertainty, I would almost always rather be top of the capital structure, senior secured. You tend to get paid back. So for our shop, the bet we've made has been on private investment grade. I like our hand. I would rather play our hand than anyone else's hand in our industry. Now, I'm kind of curious about Apollo's plans throughout the rest of this year. You're looking across Wall Street. You're seeing a lot of people either slimming back on hiring or flat out letting go of thousands of staff. What opportunity do you see there, given Apollo has already tremendously added to have headcount in the last we, of years? We will continue to grow. We've already said our business will be up in the asset management side. We've told the street better than 25% this year. On the retirement services side, better than 20% this year. And that's with an overlay to our strategy of what we call no new toys. And the reason no new toys is not to add new things. The upside from simply executing the business plan that's in front of us is so high that the price of distraction is just very hard to contemplate. So I think 23 for us, we will grow, we will add team, but we will do it in the context of the envelope of our business that exists. 
and no new toys. Are you finding it very easy these days to hire from the banks or even the technology companies that are slings back? It, it's never easy to hire. This is always about culture, but we have grown the team tremendously, and it in fact is the limiter of our growth. At the end of the day, we provide our clients judgment, and that judgment comes from people being at Apollo for a long time and integrating into our culture. We can only grow as fast as we can culturally absorb people. There's a natural hedge, if you will, or a natural limiter uh, to our growth, and we're, we watch that balance very, very carefully. Before I let you go, before Wednesday's big Fed day, what do you expect in terms of the direction of travel when you look at the interest rate trajectory for the rest of this year and what it means for the state of markets? Look, I, I think there's a, there's a push-pull. I, I think the direction of travel Wednesday is going to be up. It will all depend about the language that surrounds it and the activities that take place following it. If we have a second leg of this banking crisis, that obviously augurs for slower. If we don't and we continue to see the wage pressures that we just saw, it'll be tougher.